So good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third NAE Digital Roundtable. And please say hello in the chat box. And uh, there will also be a link for those who want a certificate of participation, students and colleagues who would like to have this certificate. Like the previous editions of this event, we are going to discuss aspects of research conducted by members of NAE at UFSC and colleagues, scholars, and artists in Ireland from our, our Irish universities. Today's roundtable, Irish Literature and Eco-Criticism, explores aspects of eco-criticism in Irish literary and cultural studies, focusing on archipelagic literature, poetry, gender and environment, and theater and the Anthropocene. This roundtable, also marks the continuity of the agreement of academic collaboration between UFSC and UCD, coordinated by Professor Margaret Kelleher at UCD and Maria Rita Drummond Viana at UFSC, who also join us today from the audience. Aline Fernandes, who is the Vice Coordinator of Postgraduate Program in English, Vice Coordinator of NEI and the Coordinator of the Group of Research in Irish Studies at CNPq, the Brazilian IRC, also join us today to chair, co-chair this roundtable. Many thanks to the students in the background in the organization, Harissa Silva and Eloisa Dalbel. So before introducing our speakers, and thank you very much for being here, John Brannigan, Lucy Collins, and Melina Sa Savi, I would like to acknowledge the participation of Ambassador Sean Hoy, who will say a couple of words to open the event today. So please, Sean, thank you very much for being here. And thank you very much, Beatrice. It's always a pleasure. And uh, good afternoon to everybody. I think we are all in the afternoon at this time of day. Um, perhaps. I'd like to start by, by saying with one very short exception, the last time we met Beatrice was in UCD. Um, and that's when I met John also. And if we're talking about putting somebody into the landscape, I've, we've actually met perhaps more times in Ireland than we have in Brazil. And that's a consequence directly of this awful pandemic that we're trying to live with. But, uh, um, you know, it's a, it's a real regret of mine that I cannot travel more, uh, be with you in Florianopolis, meet with uh, your team in person, because this for me is when I really learn about Brazil and the country that I've been in for more than two years, but most of the time actually um, in lockdown and in the pandemic. So in a sense, it makes us think deeper about some things but also experience less, and that, that's a, a trade-off. But, um, you know, when I think of, of Beatrice and UCD, I think of your wonderful contribution to our own literature and building bridges between Ireland and Brazil, and that's something that we really value. And on that last time I was home, I had a visit around Molly with Simon O'Connor, and I know the, the contribution you made, and, you know, that's something that... I just want to put on record, we, we, truly, we truly value that. But, um, you know, I participated in another event on Saturday morning uh, that was a mesa discussion on um, some Irish modern art um, interpretations. And it, it was organized by an Irish person in Rio that I had not met, Jesse, Jessica Grogan. But one of the contributors is an Irish artist, uh, Seamus McGuinness, who was talking about using material and art to encourage people to deal with suicide. And, you know, having torn shirts, collars and threads hanging down and then bringing people in because everybody plays with a thread. It's just something that's somewhere hidden in our DNA. Uh, but, and I, I was, quite taken with that whole presentation because it was involving school children, the high risk age in Ireland is 16 to 18, but it was also involving our police force because we also have very many young police officers 
who are the fun, first people to deal with these cases. Um, but he now lives in the Burren in West Clare, and he made the remark that it's very hard to separate the Irish man from his landscape. And I think there he meant man and woman. And, you know, that struck a, a note with me because I'm fortunate enough to live on our small family farm when I'm not in the city. It's where my father was born and his father. And, you know, we go back before the famine 200 years in that same little piece of Ireland. And the worn stones on the lane were worn by my people as they moved up and down the horses and the cattle. So all of that is the fabric of my landscape in a sense. And you probably can't see behind me, but this is a picture of Seamus Heaney in Toner's Bog um, that was taken by Bobby Hanvey. And he sent this to me as a personal copy because he's also from County Fermanagh. So I have always had this particular picture in, in my office everywhere I've been. But I suppose just one or two reflections on Brazil before um, you all speak. And I think um, I had a, a brief word with um, Beatrice this morning because one of the challenges on Zoom is if you say something funny, you don't know if anybody's laughing. You're dealing with a, a live audience that doesn't give you feedback. So I just needed to check my remarks uh, in advance. But I thought, you know, what one of the landmark masterpieces in Brazilian literature is Sertange by Euclides de Cunha, which is the whole story. He, he titles it The Deserts, The Dry Lands, I think is the, the actual um, proper translation. But the same story is told by Mario Vargas Llosa in a fictional way, and he calls it <clears throat> War at the End of the World. And I don't think for de Cunha, the Sertange were the end of the world. And I think there's maybe a little bit of research there, a little bit of picking uh, for some of your students. Um, but I suppose the issue I'd, I'd like to just open up is the whole issue of the Amazon. The Amazon is something that is a Brazilian asset. It is part of, it's in the heart of the Brazilian people, but it's not well understood outside of Brazil. And it's often misunderstood and misinterpreted, and sometimes deliberately misinterpreted. Um, and when we engage with government here or with civil society, we have to be very careful to try and translate the public opinion in our countries about the Amazon without crossing the line on sovereignty, without saying that we have a role, without implying that if Brazil doesn't take the lead, we will take the lead because those are not the messages, but they're often misunderstood. And Brazilians are very sensitive about how this is uh, presented. And that's totally correct. But when we're talking about words, and we're talking about leadership, finding the right words is very, very important. And this is a daily challenge to us. And, you know, I think this crystallized in my mind when I read an article over the weekend in the New Yorker, a little out of date because everything arrives late, but it was about a Kenyan uh, woman who was leading the, with a very high following on national television, wildlife programs for Kenyans, because historically it has been misunderstood that wildlife is the interest of the white Kenyans and that the black Kenyans don't have any interest in it. This is completely wrong but there was no way for this to be articulated. And these are just a couple of things that come to mind, you know, as, as we engage uh, for the next hour. So th those are my few opening remarks. I'm delighted to be here and uh, to listen in and participate if I can for the next hour. And thank you once again, Beatrice. Thank you very much, Sean. Thanks for your words and for bringing the compared perspective with our own literature and our own reality, which is also the, the reality of the world that is the Amazon that is maybe in the center of uh, eco-debate, uh, current eco-debate. But anyway, our first guest, Professor John Brannigan, is head of the School of English Drum and Film at UCD. He has research interests in the 20th century literatures of Ireland, England, Scotland and Wales, 
with particular focus on the relationships between literature and social and cultural identities and eco-criticism and environment. His most recent book, and I have it here with me, did my homework, Archipelagic Modernism, Literature in the Irish and British Isles, 1890 to 1970, explores new ways of understanding the relationships between literature, place, and environment in 20th century Irish and British writing. He was the editor of the international journal Irish University Review from 2010 to 2016. And most importantly, John was a keynote speaker at ISIL back in 2002 in Sao Paulo. So welcome back to Brazil, John. I'm really pleased to greet you this time from the screen, but from the Federal University of Santa Catarina. And how special to be talking about archipelagic studies from the island of Florianopolis, also related to this other islandic or archipelagic landscape in its history, the Azores. But let's begin our discussion. And uh, we talked a little bit about uh, what we could talk about today. And uh, my first set, set of questions are, how important is it to see Irish literature in an archipelagic context? And how does this context add to the field of Irish studies? Thank you very much, Beatrice. And thank you for showing off my, my book and for doubling the sales of my book as well. So uh, that's very much appreciated. I wish, of course, I was in uh, Santa Catarina with you, but it is wonderful to join you via Zoom. Uh, as well. Um, I think to take your question, I think the impetus in Irish studies for archipelagic approaches, uh, I think comes first of all from the kind of cultural and political implications of the Good Friday Agreement, um, because the idea of Ireland as an island and Britain as an island uh, has been very sort of powerful in political rhetoric, you know, so the Good Friday Agreement involved uh, rewriting uh, articles of the Irish constitution, which withdrew from the idea of a whole island. Um, and British political rhetoric has circled for many years around the idea of an island in a kind of defensive manner in a way that we've seen around Brexit. So the very idea of islandness in, in, Irish, in Ireland has a sort of very strong political tradition. And Notably around the Good Friday Agreement, I think more politicians began to use the phrase these islands uh, to refer to our uh, geographical realities and to prompt that discussion of what did it mean to think of ourselves not as an island singularly, but as part of an archipelago. And so archipelagic approaches have really grown out of that attempt to imagine cultural and culturally and politically what does it mean to be an archipelago of islands? And to think about islands not as insular or singular things, but as places that are defined by their relations with others and their connections with others. So there have been some really important studies, I think, in, in archipelagic criticism, which have tried to do this, um, looking at the past in particular, so here I would think about John Kerrigan's book, Archipelagic English, which looks at the 17th century and looks at the very complicated and, uh, and torn history of the 17th century between the islands of, uh, that make up Britain and Ireland. And then Christopher Harvey's A Floating Commonwealth, which I think was published in the same year, also looks at the same issue in the 19th century and looks at you know, how we can think about seas and coasts, not as barriers, but as kind of material spaces that enable connection. And crucially, I think what those archipelagic approaches do in relation to Irish studies is they enable us to move away from perhaps what's a very uh, kind of Anglo-centric focus or a very, in other cases, a very nationalist focus and to think about uh, plurality a plurality of identities, a plurality of cultures, and to think about Ireland, for example, as part of an Atlantic archipelago, to think of it as part of a Celtic archipelago, to think of it as part of a Caribbean archipelago. And when we're being really expansive, to think about the ways in which 
that archipelagic approach allows us to think even about connections between Ireland and Brazil. Uh, we share an ocean, we share connections. Um, whether it's true or not, a sort of apocryphal story is that the explorer Cabral, who uh, you know, discovered Brazil, was actually looking for High Brazil, uh, a mythical island off Ireland at the time. So we are connected. And, and I suppose that's what archipelagic approaches are all about, is exploring those connections and exploring in particular kind of pluralist identity. How interesting, John, that you're bringing in, in the first question, the political perspective, mm. the perspective of connection, the perspective of social connection. Because when we think of eco-criticism, the first thing that comes to people's minds is nature. And uh, very often, Irish writers have and still do write about, have written and still do write about nature, the pastoral, the nature poetry, and uh, saying, writing about the Aran Islands. So nature is pretty much part of Irish literature. So the Aran Islands, uh, of, for example, feature prominently in Irish. I've always considered teaching a course on uh, the Aran Islands in Irish imagination, but this has never, never happened, maybe soon. But to what extent do you think it's possible to say that Irish writers who have written about nature or islands specifically have been preoccupied with environmental issues? I think that's a really good question because um, I think when we're thinking about writing about islands, it's not always a materialist focus, right? And in eco-criticism, uh, eco-criticism tends to be dominated by a materialist focus, quite rightly, that sort of thinks about uh, the relationship with ecology, the relationship with the land as being a sort of determinant of cultural forms and cultural expressions. And I don't think that's always the case in island literature because of course, islands, I mean, I, I referenced High Brazil, you could think of about the Isles of the Blessed, you could think about Gulliver's Travels, you could think about Treasure Island, you could think about all the literatures in which islands are actually mythical places or metaphorical uh, places. But I think um, in my work, you were, you were very uh, uh, kind and generous to show my book on archipelagic modernism. And one of the things I explore in that is that around that period of the revival of the Irish revival from 1890 uh, to the 1920s and 1930s, there seemed to be a kind of explosion of interest in islands as material places. Um, and by material places, I mean that they were interested, of course, in their culture, but they were also interested in what it was like to live there and what are the, the conditions of life in those islands. And I don't think it's any accident that when Singh went there, you know, he was kind of preoccupied with a series of issues which we could call kind of anthropological in one way, but are also environmental. So there were concerns about uh, population, what happens to the population, what happens when we lose a connection with, um, you know, with the, the, with the sea, with the island, with ways of, of living uh, in those places. And although Singh works quite hard to actually present the Aran Islands as kind of primitive places, as places that are kind of outside modernity, in fact, there were lots of ways in which modernity was already encroaching upon the islands. And, you know, he went there in a steamship uh, after all, you know, but then wrote about people in curricks, right? And so you see that kind of tension that very often we write about these places as material spaces and as valuable places when actually they're endangered at that point and there are changes taking place, environmental changes and cultural changes taking place. So I think that's true and that explains the kind of flourishing of island literature throughout that period. So, you know, you have, um, you know, Singh and, and Yeats uh, writing about the Aran Islands. You have, in the 1930s, you have McNeese going off to Iceland because he thinks of it as a kind of place apart. You have a whole flourishing of Gaelic writing about the Blasket Islands uh, in the late 1920s, early 1930s, uh, which are really about that sense of, you know, islands being endangered and the sort of the culture and the ecology uh, of islands being endangered. Um, so I think that's 
one of the reasons why I think island literature in, in Ireland has been quite a powerful genre. Thank you, John. Uh, I was thinking that uh, it would be great to have you uh, in Florianopolis, <laughs> maybe in person one day for a whole course on, uh, maybe we could co-teach the course on uh, the Iron Islands in the Irish imagination. So we have literature and uh, nature and politics, but there is also another angle to eco-criticism, which is uh, science. And uh, could you talk a little bit about how important it is for eco-criticism to work with environmental science, if it is important at all, and how should that work in the Irish context? Absolutely. So I think Sean touched in his opening remarks upon the importance of this, you know, that eco-criticism in one sense is an academic discourse, but it's rooted absolutely in a concern with urgent problems, you know, about how we live on the planet and what we can do to change and what are the kind of places that are endangered. And I think there's increasing recognition at kind of all levels of decision making about the human impact on the environment and that addressing uh, environmental damage and climate crisis has to involve the humanities, the social sciences mm -hmm. and the sciences working together. And I think there are two main contributions that I would see eco criticism uh, making. The first is to be, I think, what I would call a critical friend uh, to science. And that is that the humanities are very good at questioning things, questioning assumptions and values. And I think we need as eco-critics to question the assumptions and values that underpin some of the dominant frameworks for addressing climate change and environmental crises. Many eco-critics, for example, are very skeptical about the discourse of sustainability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how sustainable is a system which currently delivers huge inequalities, injustices and precarity uh, to billions of people around the globe? And then I think the second contribution that eco-criticism can make is as a resource for thinking about uh, our past, our present, our future relationships with our environments. And I think humanity subjects are particularly good at addressing those, my own discipline, our discipline literature, I think is particularly good at that because we can think about how places are, are valued. We can think about what are the kind of, um, besides kind of economic uh, approaches and an approach to the environment as a kind of amenity, we can think about issues like sense of place and we can think about how people are kind of wedded to their environments. You know, as Sean was talking about earlier, what kind of investments of culture are made in a place you know, uh, Seamus Heaney writes about this wonderfully, of course, and is very rooted in, in a particular place. And I think literature can give us the language to talk about those values, to talk about the, the importance of the environment to us. As I say, not as amenity, but as, you know, something that we treasure and that we value. Thank you very much, John. Uh, I'm sure we will go back to uh, some of these issues uh, digitally or in person. Now we have planned this round table in a real rounds format, in a circular format. So I will now pass the screen and the word to Melina Savi, who will introduce and talk to Lucy Collins. Thank you, Melina. Thank you, Beatriz. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, John. Thank you, Alini. Thank you, Sean. Um, and so I'll introduce Lucy. Lucy Collins is an Associate Professor of Modern Poetry and Director of the MA in Irish Literature and Culture at UCD. Her research interests are in poetry and poetics with particular focus on gender and eco-criticism. Her most recent publications include Contemporary um, Irish Women Poets, Memory and Estrangement, and a co-edited anthology the Irish Poet and the Natural World, an anthology of verse in English from the Tudors to the Romantics. She is co-founder of the Irish Poetry Reading Archive and Nat National Digital Repository. So thank you, Lucy, for talking to us. And I have to say, uh, I just read your article, uh, Only the Dead Can Be Forgiven, uh, Contemporary Women Poets and Environmental Melancholia. And it's such a wonderful piece. And, 
And it's truly so that in anticipation of death and environmental emergency, and now the COVID crisis, this leads us to a place where it's hard to find solace, right? Uh, so it's a beautiful article and I highly recommend it to those who are watching us. So I have a few questions. Um, I'll start with uh, eco-critical thinking is not exclusively concerned with nature, but with concepts of environment more broadly, cityscapes and virtual environments. In what ways have contemporary uh, Irish women poets helped redefine what environment means? Well, I think, uh, thank you for your introduction uh, and your kind words about the article. Um, I think that um, Irish women, well, perhaps all women poets are attuned to issues of space and place very particularly. Um, and this partly goes back to um, what Sean was saying and, and John also mentioned uh, around the issue of belonging. Um, and the, the question, I suppose, in the Irish tradition specifically is that women poets have historically felt and indeed many currently feel that they do not quite belong. Uh, very squarely in that tradition. So very often women poets are attuned to that marginal space, uh, to that space between, and how they might speak from that space or articulate um, a perspective from uh, that space. So I think um, that's one of the reasons why women poets have been able to think in different ways about environments, uh, perhaps in, in quite original ways about environments. Now, um, there's also, I suppose, the issue of ecofeminism. And in the early phases of ecofeminism, the ways in which um, there was a problematic um, essentialism attached to the relationship between women and nature uh, that many women writers and thinkers wanted to overcome or wanted to, uh, wanted to move beyond. And they have effectively moved beyond, as we might um, talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment. Um, but I think as a result of that movement away from essentialism, um, it's very fitting that women poets uh, or women writers should think beyond the, the purely natural, uh, the category of nature, if you like, when they're thinking about environments. And uh, obviously, a lot of contemporary work uh, focuses on urban spaces and focuses on technology or digital spaces. And so women, I think, have been to the fore in thinking about how they might position themselves within those spaces and what the environmental implications are of those modes or perspectives might be. What would you say is the relationship between individual and shared loss in the context of environmental destruction um, as explored by women poets? Well, I think um, a little like what I was just, point I was just making about women's uneasy relationship to tradition. Um, I think that there has always been this difficult balance um, to be struck by women poets in particular, partly because of the role of subjectivity. Um, I'm, I'm speaking of lyric poetry specifically. Um, but there has always been a difficult balance to be struck between ideas of subjectivity and individuality and then the question of speaking of shared experience, you know, or ideas of community. And this in some ways uh, goes to a larger question, which uh, John has really already touched on, um, and, and indeed Sean too, about perhaps a problematic relationship between ideas of nation and eco-critical principles. Um, since really we should be thinking, you know, beyond the nation. And obviously John has indicated how um, ideas of the blue humanities or maritime spaces might enable us to do that, um, to think outside our, our uh, national boxes, as it were. And so I think that that question of what constitutes a community or a, a shared position in relation to, to nature or the environment um, is a, a very uh, problematic one, I suppose, and, and one which touches on the issue of the unequal access to the environmental riches uh, that we have. And this obviously is a very pressing issue in, in the Southern Hemisphere and in, in debates there around inequalities uh, in terms of access to, uh, to resources. 
And so the question of, of you know, when a, a poet or a writer speaks from a particular position, you know, are they speaking from a position of privileged access to nature uh, and perhaps a long historical privilege? Uh, or are they, they speaking from a position of marginalization or deprivation, perhaps, in terms of, of natural resources? And I think women writers and women poets are very attuned to those issues. I think they are arguably less likely uh, you know, to make that mistake of assuming uh, a certain position in relation to, to nature and resource and then perhaps other writers may do. Um, and so I think that's very much built into um, to their perspective. But I think we see in the rise of um, eco-feminism within post-colonial literary contexts, you know, and I'm thinking particularly of uh, the role of eco-feminism within Indian um, um, eco-narratives at the moment, uh, and the way in which those uh, women, like people like Vandana Shiva, for example, are very attuned to issues of activism and to the role of women, uh, not only in writing you know, great literature about environments, but also in participating very directly in, in activism uh, and in those discourses associated with activism. And so I think we can see how there's a very strong role to play um, by women writers and women poets in kind of bridging that uh, that relationship between the subjective expression and uh, you know the larger the larger debates that relate to communities or nations. Thank you, thank you so much for your answer. So you've tackled ecofeminism, um, and I'll ask. So in what ways does the representation of vulnerability link gender and environmental issues in Irish literature? Well, I think um, to go back perhaps, to double back a little bit on the question of ecofeminism, one of the interesting things I think to observe in the Irish case is that, first of all, Ireland has really come to eco-criticism late. You know, if you think about the development of the field in, in the US, uh, or in the UK, I mean, just using uh, particular comparators um, that might often be used, I think, with Irish literature. And we could see that Irish writers and critics and indeed institutions have come quite late to, to eco-criticism. And so if we were to compare, for example, the way in which eco-feminism and, and uh, other debates. So if you look at the US context, just to take that as an example, and you think about the rise of um, the addressing of environmental issues in institutions in, in, in university contexts, in particular um, in the 1960s and 70s. And you think about how that runs on parallel tracks, say, with other questions of uh, gender equality, of race and class and so on. So, you know, we see a great use of intersectional approaches there. Uh, because of the development of those discourses in tandem with one another. But I think when you look at an Irish context, you see, uh, in a sense, that feminist issues, you know, moved well ahead of debates around environment or perhaps debates around race and class, which are, are now more, more current and more pressing in Ireland, I think, in the last, uh, you know, 15 years or so. So there's a, a strange sense in which... Um, uh, environmental and gender issues are in some ways out of sync with one another, I think, in Ireland and can productively be brought together, I think, by thinking uh, more deeply about them. The other point, I suppose, to, to that grows out of that and to, to go back to the, the question of, of vulnerabilities um, is that, you know, I think there is a lot to be learned about bringing questions of environment into close contact with questions around uh, around gender and especially now around questions around queer ecologies around uh, transsexuality and so on so moving beyond the kind of first principles of feminism um, as we might have learned about them or taught them perhaps you know going back um, decades you know in, in in our teaching practices perhaps so I think there are ways in which and um, the kind of current development of gender questions can be brought into productive alignment with uh, with environmental issues. And it's interesting that Ireland should be, you know, uh, I suppose, deepening its environmental engagement at the point when uh, when that's possible. Yes, uh, completely agree. And 
And by questioning the validity of subjective experience, does deep ecology, uh, a, a term developed by Arnie Ness, compromise the newly won agency of the Irish woman poet? Well, I think I mean, the question of deep ecology is an interesting one because obviously it opposes ideas of subjectivity. You know, the notion that subjectivity is very much attached to uh, to a kind of a um, an egocentric approach to environment and to, uh, you know, perhaps a, a, a position that um, sees resources as something to be utilized by those individuals or corporations, you know, with the most power um, or the most um, leverage, I suppose, within a culture. Um, so deep ecology therefore addresses much larger questions or demands uh, new ways of thinking, I suppose, about, uh, about environmental issues that move far beyond a kind of reformist perspective, I suppose, when we think about, about environmental questions. Um, but the problem, I suppose, with the removal of that subjectivity is that, you know, we know anyone who has worked on, on Irish women poets in particular knows how hard won uh, that's that establishing a voice is, you know, and that that credibility of the woman poet as having a voice that is worth listening to um, and attending to. And so, you know, we can imagine that it's kind of difficult having uh, reached a point uh, that, that then we have to kind of hand away that subject, you know, hand away that that voice. So I think that it is it is a vexed question. And I think it's also a vexed question when we think about uh, how prominent um, issues of identity politics really have been in terms of Irish studies uh, and Irish literature as a whole. And this goes back, I suppose, to in some ways uh, John's very first point, you know, in, in approaching um, Irish literature, or archipelagic literature from that political standpoint uh, in the first instance. And um, this is true, of course, it's not exclusive to Ireland. It's, it's true in other cultures as well, where there is a great deal of focus on, on issues of, um, of national identity, of sexual identity, for example, um, or of class identity as, as being preeminent uh, and questions of environment really as being less pressing or less immediate. And I think we can see this you know, very often in, in a lot of contemporary debates in Ireland. Uh, we can see this um, being acted out, if you like, in policy issues too. Um, but I do think that I suppose to, to double back on my previous point that um, there are uh, really interesting ways, I think, in which those those forms of thought can be brought to bear on one another. And I think the extent to which a woman poet in particular very often asks us to think differently about an environment, you know, so very much to adopt a new perspective on our understanding of, of place, space and environment. And that that is a way in which without compromising that sense of voice or the sense of you know, the right of the poet to be identified, uh, you know, as the author of their own text and so on, without compromising that, I think uh, a woman poet can offer new ways of thinking through the poem, you know, and through the reading of the poem, I think that can be really productive for us today. Thank you so much. Uh, so to wrap up, uh, I'll, I'll ask you a question that you have touched upon um, in your last words. But what does poetry as a genre offer to recent environmental debates? Well, I think this is a, a very interesting question because uh, if we think of the history of eco-criticism, we often think of significant poets. You know, we think of work on Wordsworth, for example, as being, you know, underpinning that early eco-critical work in, in Britain, for example. Um, and, you know, Beatrice raised earlier that sense of, you know, the Irish nature poem, both obviously in English, but also in the Irish language as having, you know, a very strong um, resonance today uh, among general readers, as well as, you know, obviously beyond Ireland in the, in the wider world. But I think when we look now for texts that are um, politically engaged, you know, uh, from an eco-critical point of view, so engaging with environmental questions as we now face them, um, we might see poetry as sometimes falling short 
Um, there was an interesting moment, actually, I was recently editing, uh, co-editing, I was fortunate enough to, to work with Sheree Deckard, who's a colleague of, of John uh, and I in, in UCD, who works on world literatures and particularly on, on world ecology. And we were co-editing uh, an issue of the Irish University Review together. And when we were kind of thinking about the kind of text that might work with that particular um, theoretical perspective, it was actually difficult to identify poetry or or critics uh, of poetry uh, who might work in that area and um, because there was there was a less definite sort of political engagement I think by uh, by poets that's not to say it's not there I mean you can you can pick out individual poems um, that very much engage in, in that political um, realm but I think it, it would be fair to say that poetry kind of plays a long game on this and that's why I'd like to highlight the role of poetry in this deep ecological, Element. So the, the rethinking of our engagement with, uh, with the environment. So that poetry less often, I think, engages with, you know, say an immediate environmental issue or question or political moment, and more readily teaches us new ways of thinking about nature. You know, if you were to pick a poet like Maura Scully, for example, not very well known, perhaps an avant-garde uh, Irish poet, um, but who engages in an enduring way, like over 20, 25 years of work with how the individual poet might engage with their particular environment. And he does it often kind of playfully uh, in this experimental uh, form of writing. But I think that kind of work really challenges us uh, to think in new ways about poetry and about what poetry can do uh, in making us um, reach new perspectives or new understandings, I think, of environmental questions. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. And now I'll um, pass the word to, back to Beatriz. Thank you very much, Melin and Lucy. Uh, a wonderful uh, conversation that uh, I'm sure we will be able to go back to that uh, many times uh, soon and uh, when we, you can come here to visit us. Now in our round circular uh, format, I will invite Alice, Aline Fernandes, who will uh, close our discussion, addressing questions to our postdoctoral researcher, Melina Savi, focusing more now on theater. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Beatrice. So now I'll introduce Melina Sami then. Um, so Melina um, has completed her PhD at the postgraduate program in English. That was in 2018. And she's currently a CAFES funded postdoctoral researcher, researcher mentored by myself um, in a lecture at the postgraduate program in English as well. Her research interests are in the Anthropocene, in the humanities, environmental issues, and eco-criticism, currently geared towards a comparative study of a number of British and Irish plays. She has published articles on these subjects and has been teaching courses on eco-criticism at the postgraduate level. So thank you, Melina, for being here. And uh, I must say that I'm the one who's actually learning a lot about eco-criticism with you, so thank you for that. So my first question is, um, could you please walk us through your current research? So we've covered different literary genres here. How does it relate to eco-criticism, to the Anthropocene and to the place you're currently looking at? Thank you for your question. I actually have a PowerPoint here if I can share it. Let me see, because um, it's such a daunting task to speak after John and Lucy, right? <laughs> uh, let me see, okay, here. Um, so um, let me start. So I'm using eco-criticism as a methodological tool to analyze representations of the Anthropocene or more specifically, uh, representations of human exceptionalism. In three plays, uh, I'm looking at uh, Override by Stacey Gregg, the Irish playwright, um, Oil by Ella Hickson, the Contingency Plan also by Steve Waters. 
these last two playwrights are English. And I'll talk a little bit about override later. Uh, when I use ecocriticism, I like to start with a discussion on the Anthropocene because I think that more than the proposal of having the Anthropocene as the new geological epoch marked by humanity's footprint, it's an organizing principle uh, to think of the notion of human exceptionalism. Uh, this discussion has been taken up in the humanities by scholars such as Donna Haraway, who's actually a biologist, who's also a philosopher and who has such a great impact in the humanities. Also, Stacey Lemo, Rosie Bredotti, Karen Barad, Greta Gard. Uh, and more recently, I have actually come to simply love the work of Aiki. He's an indigenous activist and thinker from the Kanaki Nation in Brazil. And I think that the way he addresses human exceptionalism brings a potency we need in this rough patch that we're going through in Brazil uh, and across the globe, really. Um, but I find the idea of human exceptionalism fascinating because the notion of the atomistic standalone human is, is a very convenient story. It has been convenient for the type of stories we as humans have wanted to tell about ourselves as conquerors and manipulators of the natural world and natural forces of populations and species. But the problem is that the idea has backfired in many ways and uh, in such previously uh, unthinkable scale. I always think of an interview that one of the proponents of the Anthropocene uh, gave a while ago where he said that, uh, Paul Crutzen, right, uh, one of the chemists, he said that uh, in the 1970s among scientists, there was this dominant understanding that humans were too small to be able to produce uh, such a significant impact on nature. And yet there are authors who were publishing in this period and Ursula K. Le Guin, for instance, who were pretty much aware of the impact of human actions on earth systems and species and were outright challenging human exceptionalism. And, and rightly so, right? Because uh, human exceptionalism creates all sorts of problems that we're now uh, pretty much aware of class struggles, race struggles, gender struggles, ableism struggles, and now the earth systems are at a tipping point with huge number of scientists argued, arguing that we have passed the point of no return, the sixth extinction is underway, seas are rising, oceans are acidifying, wildfires are more violent and more frequent. Um, and there is this huge impact of climate change that as happens with everything that is bad society-wise, it will first be worst for those who are already most vulnerable. Uh, so in any case, the Anthropocene is this huge notion that is sometimes too enormous for us to apprehend, but human exceptionalism, which is at the root of the causes and conditions that have led us to name an epoch after us, is easier to spot. Uh, so there are a number of scholars among them, Adeline Jones Putra, Timothy Morton, Stacey Lemo, who address the challenges of representing the Anthropocene. It's like human exceptionalism is so prevalent that you can see it. Um, and, and it's a pre prevalent in fiction in whatever genre, and even if it's brought to the page or the stage with a grain of salt. Um, so when I look at these plays, I have some guiding questions in mind. Let me see if I can, uh, if you can see them. I ask, uh, how does the human figure, hierarchically speaking, before non-humans in nature, and how does certain humans figure hierarchically before other humans in what regards uh, class, gender, race, and geography or place? My second question is, is there mention of the impact of human processes of modernization, globalization, and consumption represented in the fictional world of the play? And how are these impacts represented in the sub subjectivity of the characters? Also, uh, do the plays suggest some sort of logic reversal in the nature culture or human non-human dichotomies that might suggest a more ecologically viable way of inhabiting the earth? And I can offer you an answer now, none of them do. And finally, uh, do the plays explore the ongoing changes that are being caused by human actions or are we offered a glimpse into dystopian worlds where there isn't much to be done anymore? So yes, these are my uh, guiding questions and my research right now. Thank you. Okay, so um, now in relation to the fact that you are actually dealing with 
Clyde, right? So you're working with Override by the Northern Irish playwright Stacey Gregg. Are you considering the productions of the play or just the, the play text itself? Um, and my question actually comes from the fact that your background is American literature. So you've dealt with novels and not theater, right? How's the play figuring in this new moment of your research? Well, theater is very new to me and Irish studies are always also very new to me. Uh, in my PhD research, I looked at three science fiction or speculative uh, fiction novels by American author Ursula K. Le Guin. And I tried to tease out from the novels uh, ways of living and worldviews that challenged the human, non-human and nature cultural logic that is prevalent in what Donna Haraway calls Western scripts. I like that. Uh, so in the first two years of my postdoctoral fellowship, I still focused more on novels still on Le Guin and on novels by Japanese American author Ruth Ozeki. Uh, and I focused on Donna Haraway's injunction for us to make kin, uh, which entails the idea of undoing human exceptionalism by giving into the confusion of borders among people, technology, the more than human world. It's, it's something she starts to articulate in the Cyborg Manifesto and develops into making odd kin in staying with the trouble. So she proposes that in times of ecological catastrophe, we shouldn't only be making kin, we should be making odd kin, uh, forming human and more than human alliances, inhabiting the belly of the monster, uh, meaning that we should be making alliances across the political spectrum, forming alliances with those with whom we are not related to by blood and with those who don't even have veins for blood to run through. <laughs> So her injunction is for us to expand the number of humans, more humans, uh, and things for whom we are responsible. But I've had the chance to offer two courses on ecocriticism um, in the last couple of years, and I started using plays to introduce this methodological approach. The students loved the plays, and the discussions when, on ecocriticism were great. Uh, it had such an impact on them. Uh, but I'm not analyzing the productions. I'm working only with the published play texts. I do read about the productions though uh, and the reviews, but as a way to have a better grasp of the play, understanding that it exceeds what is on paper. So yes, uh, I have been working with the texts alone. And uh, how are you using ecocriticism to look specifically at override? I'll, I'll just make a very brief uh, summary so that those who haven't read or watched the play, I haven't, unfortunately, uh, so that you can understand what I'm uh, saying, right? So Override is a play about a couple, uh, Violet and Mark. Let me just... Uh, who decide to live off the grid in an artificial, and this is important, it's an artificial rural area to escape or try to escape a society that has become tech driven. It's much more extreme than what we have. You can fix in scare quotes, uh, your disabilities and you can augment or enhance what you already have. You can amputate your arm and add prosthetics so that, um, so that you're stronger. Uh, you can add prosthetic legs to make you faster, prosthetic eyes so that you can use virtual reality to control electronic devices and have great vision, uh, but this supposedly purest couple, they're pregnant with their first child and they want to leave this high-tech society behind and have natural birth and go back to basics. Uh, but as events unfold, Violet ends up revealing that she has been fixed and augmented uh, to Mark's horror and dismay. Uh, so this is a couple that went to anti-tech protests together and the slogan was no hard tech, in a soft body. So the most interesting part of it all is that Mark's family owned one of the companies that sold these miraculous tech fixes, uh, while Violet's family, a working class family, consumed their products, like most other uh, working class families, because products were sold as miraculous. And it was their way, Violet explains, to try to buy what was otherwise not guaranteed, a chance at social mobility, right? So if you could improve yourself, maybe you could also improve your chances in a very unequal society. 
Um, so it's very interesting because because in the first act entitled Override, um, you learn that these check fixes and augmentations are banned. And there is huge discrimination against those who have been tweaked. Uh, and Mark, who is ultimately, we learn also a programmer, he's in fact the administrator, can override text, uh, Violet's tech fixes, and which he does, and without her consent. So the override backfires because it turns out that her um, uh, enhancements are life-sustaining. And in Act 2, basically, uh, Violet starts to melt. Uh, she has a miscarriage, then she loses the skin on her arm, then her arm. Uh, she can't see from one eye. And by the end of the play, she's a machine. Uh, and her mind is somewhere in the cloud. And Mark, uh, purest Mark, resorts to what in the beginning of the play is unthinkable. Uh, he goes to a hacker to have his eyes augmented or enhanced so that he can uh, hold Violet in his arms again, uh, this time in virtual reality. Um, so this is a play that, let me see, I think the questions are here, right? Um, this is the play, a play that tackles, uh, from my point of view, uh, first, the idealized relationship we have with nature. Uh, they're wanting to live an authentic rural experience in an environment that is completely designed uh, to make it look just like that. Uh, second, uh, it's the pushing of boundaries and what concerns the question, what does it mean to be human? Third, uh, there's this violent economic structure in place that dictates what those most vulnerable will consume and how it will affect them. And finally, there is the creation of this narrative that decides who are the outcasts, the freaks, the disposable ones, uh, when problems arise as a result of decisions made and sometimes imposed on by those in power. Uh, and in this case, it's the tech companies and the governments that ban what was once sold as a solution and what ultimately has a huge impact in war technology because they first use people with disability to uh, test their products. So to wrap up, I'll just talk about the two um, aspects I'm currently focusing on to write a paper on override. Um, I'm looking at two things. I'm exploring the, the fragility of the notion of what it means to be human, the fragility of human exceptionalism, um, and I'm also looking at um, this play with the notion of slow, slow violence that Rob Nixon develops in the book, Slow Violence and the Environmentalism of the Poor. Uh, but about human exceptionalism and the fragility of this notion, uh, Violet, whom Mark calls V, and it makes sense because by the end of the play, she's virtual reality. But I tend to think of Violet both as plant in a reference to nature and as violent because there is this underlying violence in place. But V more than once remarks on the very ordinary reality of human existence. And not only that, on the fact that if we are machines, we're not particularly efficient ones. <laughs> and she puts it this way, we're just a splat of neurons, Mark. We're not special. People make mistakes, die, reduce in carbon. Uh, and later she repeats this saying that we're just a splat of neurons and adding that we are biological machines. So in a way she's saying that we are no better than machines, subverting the idea that if, if our bodies are machines, they're not particularly precise or have a purposeful design. And we're definitely not superior to other forms of life, be they technological or not. A splat of neurons, right? She uses this um, noun that the Oxford Dictionary defines as the sound made by something wet hitting on a surface with force. It sounds like an accident, really, doesn't it? Um, but I'll just move on to the notion of slow violence to wrap up. Uh, so Rob Nixon, he defines this notion of slow violence as a violence that occurs gradually and out of sight, a violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space, a nutritional violence that is typically not viewed as violence at all. So he explains that what we usually consider violent, uh, that we usually consider violent, an action that is readily visible in time, uh, but there is a violence that has calamitous consequences and that is almost invisible until it isn't. Uh, so climate change, the coloniality of power that Inibu Kihano talks about, the transference of toxic waste and polluting industry to poorer countries, deforestation, domestic abuse, 
all of these can be characterized as low violence and the delayed effect of violence is one of the most prevailing aspects uh, of Greg, uh, Greg's override, I think. So yes, this is what I'm working on right now. And of course, there's much more to this play, but I think it's possible to get the idea of what is unfolding into a paper that I hope will be published soon. <laughs> Thank you very much, Melina. I just wanted to um, mention that um, what you um, talked to us about Stacey Gregg's play kind of adds uh, another strand to what Beatrice mentioned at the very beginning in her talk with when she uh, with John. Right, eco criticism deals with the environment, politics, technology, but also with issues of social class. Right. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Melina, John, and Lucy. I can't thank you enough for this fascinating exchange. We have a couple of thank yous and congrats in the chat box for Margaret Kelleher. Many thanks to UFSC and UCD colleagues for this rich insights, a true round table from our Consul General Owen Dennis, fascinating exchange. And from uh, David Ping, such a wonderful round table. And that's to you, uh, Lucy, you were too wonderful. <laughs> and uh, from Kathleen, who is currently a postdoctoral researcher, she finished her PhD at UFSC and she is now at TCD as a postdoctoral researcher. To John, in your book, you talk about Joyce and his relationship with the sea. Could you tell us more about his ideas regarding the sea shoreline as social constructions of geographic imagination? Sure, thank you for that question. I mean, I think the um, that's what sort of really interested me about Joyce, Joyce is that, um, you know, if you're looking around Irish literature for an engagement with the sea, for example, you know, you think, well, the first text I must go to is the, that, you know, mammoth novel that's been written on the basis of one of the best and classic uh, sea narratives of all, right? Uh, the Odyssey. And then you find that Joyce writes this novel about characters who never go to sea. Uh, they're entirely grounded. Uh, so it seemed to exemplify, you know, this kind of problematic relationship uh, in Irish culture with the environment. On the one hand, we talk a lot, as you did, Beatrice, about the sort of importance of nature uh, in Irish literature. On the other hand, we have ways of kind of thinking about the relationship between, uh, or ways of thinking about Irish culture as being completely separate from the ecology. Uh, from the environment in which it's produced. And Joyce's criticism was kind of exemplary of that for me is that, you know, there were whole analyses of the chapter in which Stephen Dedalus walks along the beach on Sandy Mount Strand, which argued that that chapter or what Stephen is really doing is thinking about philosophical uh, problems and philosophical boundaries. Well, he is, but he's also thinking about the shells at his feet, he's thinking about beaches and he's thinking about the kind of geological time which is embedded in those beaches and also the, the ways in which the coast is constantly changing. So that what seems to be a boundary is a constantly shifting boundary, you know? So that for me, it's what's exemplary of this is that, you know, when you come to Dublin and hopefully you will all be back in Dublin soon, you know, we could go for a walk around the city streets and say, this is where Joyce set this scene, this is where Joyce set this scene, etc. We could not do the same with Joyce's scenes that are set on the coast because they have changed, that those coasts have changed quite dramatically. The coasts have moved in some cases because of reclamation uh, almost, you know, a hundred yards uh, out towards the, the, into the sea. So there are kind of various ways in which um, I think Joyce, and this is what I've argued in, in the book, is that Joyce is profoundly engaged with the materialities and the ecologies um, of, of the environment, not just of Dublin as a city, but Dublin Bay uh, as well. Yeah, and I have a question to uh, Lucy from Janaina Miriam Rosa. Could you give us an example of a female Irish poet that strongly encapsulates the issue of mel melancholy and today's environmental questions? 
Yeah, th that's a very interesting one. In in the essay that I wrote, the, the one that uh, Melina referenced, I combine both Irish and British uh, women poets. And one poet who's very interesting in this, in, in respect to mood and environment, is Katrina O'Reilly. Um, she's a marvellous poet. She has three collections out uh, with Blood Axe books. And um, from the very beginning of her career, you know, she writes quite a lot about nature, um, quite a lot, in fact, to, uh, to reference John's interest there uh, on water. Um, so rivers or, or literal um, spaces where, you know, there's this boundary between uh, between land and water. And that's very, um, very tied to ideas of to this mood, to this mood of grief or sadness. Um, it's difficult to in some of the more recent poems, I think it's easier to see this as to see the, the space and the reflection on the, that space as generative of mood. Whereas in some of the earlier work, you might see the dynamic going the other direction, if you like. So in other words, that the mood is is a is created from within, as it were, but finds its expression through um, these kind of uh, border um, landscapes, you know, and these these landscapes that are between um, between earth and water. I think um, in terms of issues of, I suppose, uh, feelings of grief that are very explicitly connected to environmental loss, um, Paula Meehan would actually be an interesting figure. Because on the one hand, um, you know, perhaps a, a first look at Paula Meehan associates her very much with Dublin and very much with that, that sense of a Dublin working class identity uh, and a, an urban um, space. But and it, that's true. That is certainly true of her work. But if you if you look at her work overall, you find a very strong attention to nature within those um, spaces and also to to its depletion or the, the threat to nature. It, that comes out quite strongly, too, in her um, wonderful lectures she gave as part of the Ireland Professor of Poetry. Those lectures were published by UCD Press. Um, and so I think if we look at the lectures kind of in tandem with the poetry, we can see that sense of and you know of grief for a threatened environment very strongly. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, we are uh, reaching the end of the discussion, but I will have one last uh, question from Paige Reynolds, who was uh, who visited us in our last uh, in person uh, Jornada of Irish Studies in Florianopolis. So I will include her last question. Your discussions cite experimental writers in particular. Why do you think such difficult forms are often invoked in the consideration of ecological issues? It's to everybody. So does anyone want to address that? Perhaps Melina to close the discussion? Why do you think experimental writers uh, often invoke the consideration of ecological issues? I think that it's because of what I said in the beginning, it's, it's such a difficult thing to represent. Uh, you can quite, I wouldn't say easily, but more often you see the subjective impact of ecological crisis um, on paper and perhaps on stage. Uh, but for you to represent this huge ecological crisis, I mean, how do you represent sea rise that hasn't affected you, you yet? Uh, uh, unless you're related to someone or you have directly impact, um, have been directly impacted by these issues, it's something that's out there in the future, far away. So I think that uh, experimental writers, they have this... Um, they, they can play more freely maybe with this very confusing idea of ecological catastrophe still. Thank you, Melina. So we have to close the session, but Sean, would you like uh, to perhaps say closing words and uh, before we, we all go? Well, thank you very much to everybody. Um, I mean, I'm just thinking back to when we do our wordsmithing and writing our speeches and um, trying to be very careful, not only to get the message right, but to get a message that can't be misinterpreted. One of the things we often do is quote somebody else. And it's something that's always done in speeches. 
and then that leaves it up to others to interpret what was being said. And I've been listening very carefully for something that I can quote the next time I have to deal with some of these issues. So it's been fascinating for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sean, uh, Melina, Lucy, John, and Alini. And thanks to everybody uh, who followed us uh, this afternoon. And see you for the next, uh, in the next roundtable. Bye.